Okay, Hebrews chapter 3. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, <clears throat> firm unto the end. Remember last week we talked about hope and how you have to hold that confidence. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, <coughs> harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is yet called today, lest any of you be hardened through, through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. So exhort one another, admonish, encourage, support one another daily while it is yet called today. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Day, day of course, not talking about uh, any... 24 hour period there it's it's a day it's a period of time an era of time we're in this day of grace this day of sal salvation and an acceptable time god said i've heard you and so we uh call on the lord while he may be uh found call upon him while he is near seek the lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near so uh, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful, and the deceitfulness of sin is to harden your heart. And harden, hardening your heart has everything to do with um, <clears throat> disillusionment and bitterness and cast down hopes and, and things like that. The destruction of a heart or the destruction of, of confidence and hope and faith is through the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin is that sin motivates you to set a hope, an expectation. And as we talked about hopes last week, you have to set your hope in God. right? And if you don't set your hopes properly, and hope is something that we do set, and as we set hope, Hope develops into a a more progressive and complicated uh, vision, let's say. A vision. It becomes more uh, structured and defined and specific and uh, hope develops like that. You know, so let's say I hope I, I could get a new car. Well, that's a pretty general hope. I hope I get a new car. So I say, okay, I'm just going to hope I can get a new car. Well, that's a fairly generalized hope. And if I keep embracing that hope, uh, and that hope comes, of course, as a result of a, of a desire, to desire a car, so I hope to get one. And then through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So how might I get this car? Well, maybe I can get a job. Okay, so I hope I can get a job so I can get a car. You see, mm -hmm. now the hope, the hope is developing. It's turning into a vision. <laughs> okay, well, so I hope I can get a job. Well, then it might get more specific. Well, I can't get a job as a nuclear scientist because I'm, you know, I've only graduated from high school or something. Maybe I can get a job as a janitor. Maybe I can get a job, whatever. Then, so then you see the hope. The hope unfolds. It gets specific. It develops into a, a vision. You know, without a vision, the people perish. Well, that's true on the side of righteousness and on the side of unrighteousness. You don't hope for anything. You don't pursue anything. There's no life in you. So anyway, the deceitfulness of sin is to get you into this exercise of hope and then have the hope uh, not come to pass or when, when hopes don't come to pass, it, you, you become disillusioned. And disillusionment is the, the forerunner to uh, bitterness. First, you're disillusioned sort of perplexed why this thing can't come to pass, what went wrong. And uh, as long as you embrace a hope and don't let go of the hope, uh, well, that, that would be a problem if it's a false hope or an ungodly hope. 
And this is the this is the operation of God and the exercise God has us in to bring us through experiences, things that will defeat and cause us to let go of our old hopes. So we can have eternal hopes and set our affections on the things above. And it's like we we're saying the other week, no man can serve true masters. If you're primarily fixed on the hopes of this life, and if we have only hope in Christ in this life, only, what are we? We're of men most we're the most miserable men. We're more miserable than the heathen if, if we have hope only in this life in Christ. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, the whole hope thing is, is coming into play here. The deceitfulness of sin is to cast down a hope, make it disillusioned, get you into bitterness, discourage the heart so that it does not think it's worthwhile to invest in hope anymore, you know, to defeat hope. Well, I believe it's in uh, Lamentations chapter 3 the, when, La, when Jeremiah is in his great uh, bitter trial there. Lamentations. He's in he, he, Jerusalem is destroyed and all of that. And somewhere in Lamentations, well, Lamentations three starts like this: I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He had brought me into darkness and not into light. And he goes on and on and on and on. That's not in my notes or anything. I'm just thinking of it now. Well, he he went. He really ran through something there, Jeremiah. But in that whole discourse of of the bitterness, bitter experience God was bringing him through. You know, he, he eventually he does um, voice some hope, and he says, uh, it "Is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed." This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. So, as you see, he still had hope in all of that. He still had a little seed of hope—not hope in the world, but hope in God, based on confidence in the mercy of God. So. Where am I going with all this? Oh, then, then he says, uh, To subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. So when God disappoints our false hopes and brings them to naught, sometimes it feels like, well, God's overthrowing my cause. And if we're confident in our cause, then it, it doesn't seem fair to us or doesn't seem right that God should overthrow our cause. God doesn't approve, it's not that God approves in overthrowing men in their causes and just spoiling, spoiling them for his pleasure. It's just God has to overthrow the false causes, the ones that are just a distraction to us, and the ones that keep us from focusing on what God wants us to focus on, the pursuit of eternal life. And, uh, you know, these are they that where the seed fell, and uh, it began to grow, but it, it, it thorns and nettles and weeds grew with it, and they, it choked out the words, and it was not brought to perfection. It was not fruitful. These are they which hear the word and believe it, but because of the cares of life, the pursuits and the hopes and the ambitions and the occupations of the things of this life choke out the development and cultivating of the word of God. So... Sin is deceitful, and sin wants to harden your heart. And the way sin wants to harden your heart is he wants to cast down your hope. He wants to have, get you to set a hope, then he wants to destroy that hope and make you bitter so that you do not trust anymore. Hmm. The best way to describe this in a relationship, of course. Let's say you have a, a relationship, a man and a woman, and uh, uh, it doesn't really matter to me which one is which. You know, the man betrays the woman or the woman betrays the man. Take your pick. I don't care. But one betrays the other one. You know, you have love and love is based on trust. You know, you've heard, heard, heard people say, you know, I, you know, I do what love, I don't, I don't act, uh, for me love isn't a feeling. I just do what love requires. Well, in a general sense, I suppose that's true. Sometimes you can just do what's required because love dictates that. But what's the first thing that love requires? What's the first? If, if a man is a steward of God and he loves God, moreover, yeah, it's found in stewards if, if, that a man be faithful. So what's, what is required of love? What's the first thing that love requires? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. And if you don't get that, then, then nothing else you do matters. Nothing. Faithfulness is what matters with, with love. Do what love requires, then do your acts of faithfulness. All right. So, uh, love. And you can talk all day about love, too. 
So where am I? Uh, <clears throat> hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Yeah, so a man cheats on a woman or is unfaithful. A woman's unfaithful to a man. You were trusting. You, hope, you were hoping that they would be faithful to you. And that hope of their faithfulness has become overthrown. And what does that cause? Well, that causes rejection. That means they don't love me. That's the witness. They don't love me. Or they love someone else better. Or they don't love me enough. And that's a wound. That's rejection. And rejection is very fundamental to, uh, very fundamental to describe the, state, the condition of a wounded heart by which Satan hardens you through his deceitfulness. So if you're wounded, rejected, and betrayed, that is an experience. We talked about how experiences, last week we talked about how experiences of God bringing you through trials make you more confident that he'll bring you through the next time, right? <laughs> well, just like, like that, with the deceitfulness of sin, every time you're betrayed, that experience makes you much more confident that you'll be betrayed again. And it, it leaves you with the reluctance to put your trust in anybody or anything. And if you can't put your trust in anything, or any, then you won't put your trust in God, perhaps, right? It's yeah. Potentially, you won't put your trust in God. Yeah. And when you can't trust anyone, when you feel like you can't trust anyone because you've been betrayed or wounded or rejected, and those wounds of uh, experiences and wounds have convinced you to protect yourself from any kind of uh, um, injury like that again, then, then that's what you do. You go into a self-protecting mode, a self-keeping mode. You keep yourself from getting hurt. But in so doing, you build a wall to protect yourself. But you are trapped inside behind that wall. Yeah. And you are all alone behind that wall. Amen. So you're protecting yourself from being, you feel like you're protecting yourself from ever being wounded or hurt by people ever again. And you protect yourself by... Guarding your heart and not opening your heart, and I'm not going to trust anybody. And so therefore your heart is closed to, to that which is without you. And the, and the worse you get in that condition, the stronger or the higher a wall that you build. Right? And then you are isolated. You are, you have been, <laughs> sin has been successful in deceiving you deceitfully through the gall of bitterness, through wounds of rejection. To try to protect yourself and keep yourself and this is where love or charity has to be brave sometimes. It has to take a risk sometimes, right? Charity. It has to open yourself up with the possibility of perhaps being betrayed or wounded or rejected. But isn't that what this is all about in our fellowship with Christ and His sufferings? He was despised. He was rejected of men. He was acquainted with grief and sorrow, and we're supposed to follow on to know all that. So with the Christian walk, coming to know the Lord, with it comes the expectation of rejection. Because he was rejected. So rejection is a very touchy subject here. Because when you're rejected, the devil can sin, can capitalize that and harden you through deceit. To close your heart, protect yourself, and keep yourself, and I'll never, I'm, I'll make sure that never happens again. I'll never uh, trust another man as long as I live, and whatever, you know, woman or whatever the case is. But in so doing, you're holding, you're, 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 you're closing yourself off, and also from the wounds of rejection and the gall of bitterness, uh, from that foundation of sin is born is born the spiritual issues of the want of comfort. The want of comfort. Like when you're wounded, you, you need to be healed. You want to be comforted. Right? It's a cry for comfort. And we talked about comfort, I don't know how long back. It was a while back. God has provisions for comfort. Okay, There's a godly comfort. Comfort of the scriptures. The Holy Ghost is the comforter. I will not leave you comfortless. And those are the things that you have to embrace because there's a godly comfort and there's an ungodly comfort. Now, you remember the uh, cry of Sodom and Gomorrah? They came up before God. God saw the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was great. The cry was great. The cry, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what was Sodom and Gomorrah known for? You know, sexual perversion. And that's the trumping, uh, comforting experience in, in the flesh is, is sex. Sexual perversion. And so if people are in bondage to deep sexual, constant, excessive amounts of sexual 
gratification, it's because there's some grievous cry down there, and there's some gall of bitterness, and there's something that's wounded that's never been healed and doesn't want to open up, so it's behind a wall that they have built, and and that's the way it is. It's, sin brings you into the pursuit of every kind of ungodly comfort. Now, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was known for its sexual immorality. What, did it, what was that a result of? That was because of the great cry that went up. And God said, I'll come down and see whether it was altogether according to the cry of it or not. And if so, and, and if not, I will know it. Well, with every kind of pursuit like that, uh, of comfort, there's a cry. But, but somehow the cry has to be dealt with in a godly way. You can't slightly heal God's people. You have to expose that wound and you have to somehow discover all those things through a, um, a, you know, through a gradual practice and exercise of preaching and revelation and seeking God and praying and seeking to overcome and all those things. But the devil is going to use rejection and God is going to use rejection. Rejection <coughs> is separates you. If you feel rejected, then you're isolated. That's that's the that's the uh, that is the state of being in torment when you are isolated. Did anyone anyone ever go through periods of intense struggling, uh, wounds, loneliness, and rejection, and you feel like you're completely alone? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Nobody understands. That's that's torment. That's a soul that has been isolated behind a wall. And that's a heart. We, we don't want to be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin as sin tries to do that to us. Now we just don't want to uh, shallowly pacify people's wounds. You know, People's wounds are, are real, but so are the sin and the iniquity that caused it. So there's a balance there. There's a cry, but then there's a sin and there's an iniquity, and that has to be dealt with. And what you find is uh, a lot of the time we em embrace things to the point where uh, it's hard for us to let go of our embraces of false comforts if we've been exercising them for a long time. And that's when you talk about be having a stronghold, a stronghold. Uh, what was that devil they couldn't cast out? Yeah, the, the and uh, he said, well, you couldn't cast them out because of your unbelief. You know, why couldn't we? I brought this to your disciples and they couldn't cast them out. How come, how come we, they couldn't cast them out? And he said, well, because of your unbelief. I said, well, who's, uh, and I always like to say, who's unbelief? It couldn't be the devil's unbelief because the devils believe and tremble. It couldn't have been Jesus' unbelief because Jesus is the perfect man. <clears throat> so somehow, if we don't have true faith and hope in God and looking to Him for our provisions, whether it be physical, spiritual, provisions of comfort, emotional, then uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we're lacking in faith. Paul says, I'm going to come and speak if I might impart into you words and perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So we have faith, but sometimes faith is lacking in certain areas. We just don't have the confidence to get our comfort from the Lord, and so we get it from whatever, something else. Whether it's a bottle or women or whether it's uh, too much YouTube or whatever it is. You understand? So that's... That's, that is a symptom of a wounded heart that's trapped behind a wall, that's reluctant to trust and come out and can't make a connection with God for His comfort and His provision. And somehow you've got to minister through that. That's kind of like the type of what Jericho was. Jericho was a walled city. And Jericho was an evil city. It was a wicked city. That's what happens when we get trapped behind our walls of our of how we try to protect ourselves. And it's all based on fear of getting wounded again. Fear of. God came to deliver them who all their lifetime were subject to bondage through fear of death. I, I fear that death of rejection. So I, I'm going to build this wall and let nobody get close to me. Oh yeah, yeah, I get all this uh, Christian charity and be open with one another and all that. I understand that. Now that's all good and fine and dandy and everything. Just, but just leave me out of it, all right? 
Lord of Worlds. <laughs> so, and that's why you have to exhort one another daily while it is yet called today. We can't let ourselves be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And deceitfulness of sin is to capitalize on the wound, on the betrayal, on the gall of bitterness on, and rejection. And you know how I started hitting that principle, one of the first things, when I came here 15, 17 years ago. The gall of bitterness is bond to iniquity. So you think you're protecting yourself, but you are in an iniquitous practice. You've isolated yourself. You are separated. You are alone. You are tormented. And you're left to fend with all of this stuff all by yourself. That's the deceitfulness of sin. <clears throat> all right. So, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now that scripture reads more like he's talking about physical death, but I still uh, think it's fair ball to spiritualize the idea of the fear of death. Okay, just like, um, uh, just like you can uh, apply the scriptures to the plan and purpose of God over the course of time, you can also apply the, the, the same principles of God to the perfection of a saint over the course of time. So, if you look at the whole creation in general, God is perfecting a creation. But the same pattern follows through on the individual creature that he is perfecting. So, therefore, when you talk about fear of physical death, you have to, to talk about the fear of another fear of death. And uh, the fear of death I'm going to talk about is uh, fear of rejection. <laughs> when you are rejected, you see, every human... Every human heart is seeking to identify and be joined with something or someone else. They want to identify with something, and usually, if not always, greater than themselves, because nobody wants to be really in that lone, alone state, because that alone state is torment. I mean, we used to, as kids, uh, I don't know, this, a couple of times as kids, we were think and muse about boy can you imagine if if that if the whole earth were blown to smithereens and there's and everybody was destroyed and you were the only person left on earth hmm. what would you do what reason would you have to live you're the only person on earth i know it's kind of hokey and hypothetical but the point is is you you can't be alone like that without being in torment yeah. And that compels everybody to try to identify with something. All right? So whether, and that's what peer pressure is all about. You, you try to do the things that your friends are doing for life so you can be accepted. Well, why do you want to be accepted? So I'm not alone in this torment. So I'm a part of something. Well, the Christian, of course, his identity, his life is hid with Christ and God. Your identity, it has to be with God. All right, so people are afraid of death. The fear of death, then, I'm, uh, I'm making it akin to the fear of rejection. People are feared to be rejected by everybody. Now, some people I'm not afraid to be rejected by because I know there's another group of old people over here that accept me. <laughs> right? Accepted the blood. Yeah, we'll get to that, yeah. That's just kind of the natural next step in all of this, accepted in the beloved. But the point is, you, you can't handle rejection. It, it's a devastating thing. It's the, one of the hardest things to deal with is rejection. Whether you're actually being rejected or whether you feel like you're being rejected. And here's the thing about the deceitfulness of sin. You can be rejected and you can focus on your rejection and embrace your rejection so much that you exaggerate the consequence of it to yourself. And then you can be rejected so much that, that all you expect is rejection. Yeah. So you're predisposing rejection before the fact, even before the incident. Okay, let me tell you a story about Elvis. Now, I don't know if it's true, but I heard it on the, on the news. I can't, don't remember the source, but 
Now, at this point, I don't care if it's true or not. It, it has a ring of truth, and it will still prove my point. People are trying to uh, satisfy and assuage the feeling of their pain, of the wounds, of their rejection. And, of course, the, the only way you can ever heal that is to find, a, find out your place in, in the eternal purpose of God. If you don't do that, you, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. So the story goes that Elvis Presley... And I'm saying he's in the root of bitterness. Uh, he had, uh, so they say that he he would he had a room or something, and he had mirrors all over the ceiling so he could look at himself when he was in bed, and all all kinds of things to to kind of glorify himself to try to overcome his all all his rejections. But that in his later years he'd come off off the stage after a performance where all his fans were just going nuts, just loving him idolizing him, screaming and yelling and carrying on, just loving the man, idolizing him, adoring him, enthusiastic response, and he'd come back afterwards and he'd curse his fans privately backstage mm. as though he was being rejected. Mm. And everybody out there was accepting him. <laughs> but the rejection in his heart was so bad, he was always convinced that they're always rejecting me. And so he would respond accordingly, even if it wasn't so. So there, there is a, a terrible trap there. So imagine going out there and coming back, saying, "You see that? You see that? They just those bunch of bleep 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 bastards or whatever." He and he curse and swear, and he he curse them and call them down and berate them, and so they're rejecting him. Well, brothers, I've seen preachers do that, so set on rejection that they just uh, malign and attack and uh, smite. And strike with stripes hundreds of times the congregation. And a lot of the time, the rejection is not to, to the extent that it's perceived to be. Because the expectation of rejection is so strong, you've already predetermined, predisposed that you're going to be rejected. And your reaction's based on your expectation instead of based on what's really happening. And then you end up murdering many of the people that accept you or are trying to accept you and that's the devastating it part that's the devastating part about rejection there's something about rejection that's almost pitiful you see there's a terrible wound that needs to be healed but there's something else about rejection that's just that's very uh, malicious and injurious that murders the other person if the expectation of rejection is perverted if it's too strong it you know they, they say that people who are paranoid, when you're paranoid, uh, you have the expectation that everybody's out to get you, right? And it's based on fear. And the person who's paranoid is expecting it so vividly that to him, it's, it's real. You know, as, as the, uh, the sort of the, the joke goes, I mean, to make the point, uh, you, you say, uh, it, it was said about the paranoid man, he says, oh, I'm, I'm not paranoid. Everybody really is out to get me. <laughs> he believes that. He believes everyone's out to get him, even when everybody is not out to get him. And so what that issue does is that issue accuses everybody of being against him when everybody is not against him. You see that? And in so doing, it's slandering the character and the intent of the other person because of your wound. So rejection is a devastating thing. And we got to deal with rejection because if we don't deal with rejection, well, I go through it myself. You know, there's lots of things. You, you, you got to be careful how we perceive things. And I've said this before as an example. You know, if you're going through a really rough time and you're depressed and you're all wrapped up in your own burden and uh, you don't have anything particularly against me or anything, and I pass you by and I say, uh, Bless Brother Carl, how are you today? And you just walk past, and Carl just walks past with his face to the ground. And I'm full of rejection. I said, that brother, you see that? He despises me. I said, praise the Lord to him, and he wouldn't even say praise the Lord back. What the hell is wrong with that man? That he has no love of God in him. Well, maybe, maybe I'm trumping that up. Maybe, or maybe the rejection in me is trumping it up. Maybe Carl has nothing against me. Maybe he's just distracted with a whole bunch of burdens and, and you know, everything, everything to Carl that day was, anybody who talked to Carl that day, to him it was just, it didn't register because he was just 
really having a hard time. It had nothing to do with me personally. But I could take it personally, right? I could construe it as something personal. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> We've watched preachers. I don't believe anything I say. You never do. What's wrong with you people? And they go on and on and on and on and on. And half the people aren't like that. Half the people do understand what he's saying. Half the people do accept him and trying to hold him up. But his own rejection is, is distorting and skewing his perception of things. He expects it so strongly that his reality is his expectation and not re- what's reality. And that's, that's when you get into all the weird stuff like other stuff. Like, that's the way paranoia is too. Paranoia believes its expectation of everybody being against them and has concluded it's true based on its fear and its expectation, not based on the reality of what's out there. Because it's trapped in its own little world of wounds and iniquity. It's because the soul is behind a wall of protection. And like I said, when a man has that much rejection, that he predisposes and predetermines that he's going to be rejected before he gets rejected. And no matter how you respond, no matter what you do to try to demonstrate that you don't reject him, he, he, he perceives it as rejection anyway because he's just determined to be rejected before, <laughs> before the fact. Well, you, you can never win that game. You can never appease a man like that. You can never satisfy him. You can never give the correct response. It, it'll never happen. Because there's an issue in his heart that has to be healed. There's an issue of rejection in there. Anybody, who's, anybody who is excessively wrapped up in sexual perversion is also in the gall of bitterness and has a great deal of wounds and rejection inside of them that were never properly dealt with. And not to blame the individual necessarily. It could have been the, the circumstances they come up, came up in. and Who knows? But that's, that's all I'm saying. It's a symptom. It's a symptom. So Elvis Presley would curse his fans, the ones that actually loved the guy. Just idolized him, worshipped him, completely wrapped up in him. Pay money to see him. And, and glad to see him, right. Pay money to see him. But he was convinced through his own gall of bitterness, through his own expectation of rejection, that they were all against him. Nobody believed him. Nobody received him. Well, I thought that was interesting. So his rejection can never be satisfied. Yeah, it's a trap. Rejection like that, it's implacable, cannot be appeased. And it's a losing battle. Uh, so we're going back to this, uh, why could we not cast them out because of your unbelief? He said, how be it this, this kind comes not forth by prayer and fasting. And so what that implies is that there are certain kinds of bondages that are extremely strong. Our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's one of the strongest holds that the devil has here is this, this, um, this pattern of wounds and rejection and then giving his comfort. And if you, the more you get exercised in it, the more strong you get in that delusion, the harder it is to come out of it. Well, <clears throat> all right. Yeah, so the expectation of rejection. So if I'm, now, the other thing is rejection. You know how um, the invisible forces of, of, of the world, like magnetism and electricity, you, you know that those things do exist, but you can't see them. You can't see electricity and you can't see magnetism, but you know they're there because of the effect that it has on things that you do see. So if I have iron filings on a table and I hold a magnet close and the iron filings all move around all, almost by themselves, although I can't see the magnetism, but I know it's there by the reaction of the iron filings. That's the way the spiritual realm is. You can't see the spiritual realm, but you know it's real because of the effect that it has on people, so on and so forth. Um, for example, there was a cartoon. I don't remember what it was. I think it was a Japanese cartoon. It had a certain demon on it, and they, when this cartoon played, uh, thousands or hundreds of Japanese kids went into seizures, Mm-hmm. All at the same time. 
all at the same time, all at the same moment that that cartoon was playing. The same moment of the episode of the cartoon. Yeah, I don't know if it was Pokemon or not, but they all went into a seizure. Well, how can they all go into a seizure all at the same time? Unless there's a spiritual force there, you see? That, so you don't see the spiritual force, but the reaction on all those kids, this phenomena says to you, there's got to be a spiritual realm. Um, so, rejection. Uh, so I always said it this way. Two people that are full of rejection. If I expect you to reject me, I expect people are going to reject me. <clears throat> then, I, And I've already concluded it. That, that means I don't, I'm not, I don't have a very good vote of confidence in your integrity, do I? Because I've already decided you're going to reject me. Now, you can have all the integrity in the world, but if I'm hardened through the deceitfulness of sin and I've decided you're going to reject me because that's what I'm convinced of and my heart's been that hardened, then uh, that expectation is a spirit. I'm expecting you to reject me, so I'm emanating that. There's a spiritual emanating force that is coming out of me, out of my heart. The expectation that you're going to reject me is coming out as a spiritual uh, issue. And I'm, I'm already cynical. Okay, That would make me cynical about you. Oh, there's Christopher. He's probably going to reject me. So I'm already issuing the ex cynical expectation of him rejecting me. He picks up on that. Without saying a word, that issue makes him look at me and says, Oh, look at Jonathan. Look at the sour face on him. I wonder what's wrong with him. Boy, he looks miserable. I really don't want to be around him today. So Christopher walks the other way, and I go by, See? 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 I told you. See? He rejected me. But really, the cause and effect there is my expectation of rejection put a force that compelled him away from me. It's my expectation of rejection that caused the whole thing. And what did Job say? That which I feared the most. Yeah. And what did Brother Stair say? Fear is faith in the devil. Fear is a kind of a faith. Fear of rejection becomes faith that I'm going to be rejected. Confidence. And that confidence grows that I'm going to be rejected. Just the way we talked last week, your confidence grows that God's going to deliver you. Well, the same with sin. You get hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, Sin, you become more and more convinced, oh, I'm going to be betrayed, and yet I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be this. But this, here's where it gets really sticky. Because in the sufferings of Christ, sometimes you are going to get rejected. Right? Sometimes you are going to re be rejected. But you have to be, you have to perfect this thing so that you are being rejected for righteousness sake. You can be rejected just because the expectation of rejection emanating off of you is like a magnetic force kind of uh, repelling people away. And now it's, how's that? How, what if you have two people full of the expectation of rejection? You ever take a magnet and has a North Pole and a South Pole? And you put the North Pole to the South Pole and they stick together? And you put the North Pole to the North Pole and they push each other apart? Well, let's say I have the expectation of rejection. That's the North Pole of a magnet. And you have the expectation of rejection. That's the North Pole of a magnet. We're just going to, is there going to be a natural spiritual force like magnetism pushing us apart all the time? So, expectations. What's our expectation? Well, and you got to get the rejection thing right. I mean, because we are going to be despised and rejected, but it has to be for righteousness sake. It's another thing that we've seen over the years. Many people try to take the issues, uh, the cause and effect of their own sin and iniquity, driving people away, putting people in a position where they can no longer be partaker of another man's evil, then that man misappropriating them the, that and calling it the sufferings of Christ when it's not the sufferings of Christ. And that man isn't being rejected because of the sufferings of Christ. So it's a sticky thing with rejection because what do you do? Because the Christian is supposed to be rejected, despised and rejected. But why? Why are you despised? Why are you rejected? It's like I was saying last week, we've heard, why did they leave Jesus? Why did they leave Paul? Well, if Paul the Apostle catered his ministry 
to seduce all the women that came his way and had sex with everybody else's wife, and people got disillusioned and left him, then Paul would not be suffering for righteousness' sake. He can't say that's the sufferings of Christ, because it's not. So that's why Paul was so adamant. Oh, well, I'm going to make sure that I keep my body under subjection, and I'm, I'm going to consciously, deliberately do everything in my power to, to do nothing where the ministry can be blamed. Because if I suffer, I want it to be clean, pure. I want it to be the sufferings of Christ. For righteousness, for righteousness sake. So you can't misappropriate the sufferings of Christ and try to tag it on the consequence of your sin and iniquity. That is a, it's a blasphemy, it's a false witness, it's a lie. Rejection is real though. Some, sometimes you do get rejected for righteousness sake. And it's always for the righteousness sake and for the gospel. Remember Jesus said, He that uh, uh, saveth his own life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake and the gospel. Right? Some people, Paul said, I can give my body to be burned and I don't have charity. What does it profit me? You know, I can go to war and die nobly for my country, give up my life. Well, if it's not because of the love of Christ and for the sake of Jesus Christ and the gospel, what does it profit? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, a root of rejection, yeah, an expectation of rejection, and con uh, an expectation so strong that it's counted reality before the facts, before it really is rejection, or before it's really known that whether it's rejection or not, it is always going to impute and charge the other person uh, prematurely and can never be appeased as long as it's in that state. And what you fear the most comes upon you. And when you fear, fear hath torment. And as we said before, there's two primary motivations of the heart, fear and faith. You want to look at it that way. Okay, and we look at this even in terms of the end of the age, you know. Uh, if, if you're afraid of what's going to happen with the new world order and all of that kind of stuff and fear that you won't be provided for and so you start stockpiling years and years of food and clothing and everything else, well, brother, that doesn't really jive with the rest of the scripture, right? That's what the heathen do. The, the, Jesus says, take no thought what you eat, drink, and how you be clothed. Don't take any thought for that. Now, God's going to provide. He might keep bringing ravens to bring... Food to Elijah, you know, he can, God can do anything like that. So, and, and uh, some of the people who embrace Christianity, so-called Christians, they have kind of a, a survivalist approach, and it's, a lot of the time it's based on fear. And so fear is not faith, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So you've got to evaluate or examine yourself. Let every man examine themselves, whether he be in the... Faith. So what are you doing? Are you doing it by fear or doing it by faith? And it's much the same uh, idea with rejection or providing for yourself. Uh, it's all self-keeping, keeping myself, protecting myself. When you're wounded in the wounds of rejection and betrayal and you build a wall around yourself and you won't open your heart to anybody, then the only comfort you have left is the uh, futile comforts of Satan. As we said before, anything from overeating to over YouTubing to over sexing or uh, whatever your comfort is, whenever you are like that. So, expectation of evil is based on the accumulated confidence of remembering all the past galls of bitternesses that you've been through. Okay, the expectation of God and His goodness and His righteousness. And your hope in God is based on the remembrance of all the things He brought you through. Love of God is shed brought in your heart by the Holy Ghost. It's the same pattern here. All right, so, uh, and then I always keep coming back to referencing the, the vision of the wounded sheep that uh, Brother Stair played from a sister years, years ago. And there are many wounded sheep and... Uh, <clears throat> When you, when you have a condition where there's so much uh, wounding, as Isaiah said, the whole head is sick, the heart is faint, there's no soundness in the body, but from the head to the foot, it's all wounds, open wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, and it has not been mollified with ointment, and it hasn't been healed or bound up. 
well, that's a very grievous uh, state of affairs because if somebody's wounded, somebody else is wounded, can't wound a wounded person because both of them are wounded. Yeah. It's like I say, that they both got the chip on their shoulder. They're both maybe expecting evil from each other. And that's not a very good scenario for healing. And then the, uh, the uh, vision of this wounds and healings, the, the sister said, only those that have been healed or are in the process of, he of being healed are able to minister the healing to someone else. Which is true, isn't it? I mean, God, God, I mean we can't love God till. He first loves us. And if we can't love God starting off because we're, we're in the gall of our bitterness and we've lived a life of sin and, and flesh and iniquity, we're not capable of loving God. So God better, and God doesn't need healing. God's perfectly healed. He's never, right? I mean, he's, <clears throat> I won't say God never gets wounded because Jesus was wounded. His heart was broken and everything else. But what I'm saying is God has enough soundness in his heart that he loves first and then then we can love God. And it's the same with healing, because healing is going to take a perfect administration of God's love, not, not just uh, slightly healing and not always nice talk and all of that kind of thing, but sometimes, you know, I mean, Bible does say, be kind and be tender-hearted, forgiving one another if any man has a quarrel against any, any. But in the Bible, it's like we're saying back in Hebrews 3, let's exhort one another daily while it is yet called today, because Satan is trying to harden our hearts and whenever you have people full of fear and wounds and rejections have been through betrayals, betrayals and their motivations are fear and the idea is for them to keep themselves and protect themselves and in so doing they, there's a wall of separation going up well then the body of Christ becomes separated we become cut off for our parts so opening the heart always has a risk you know that? opening your heart always has a risk in order for you to take that risk, you have to have confidence that God, if I get wounded, God can heal that heart. Or God will turn that wounding experience into a sweet fellowship with his sufferings. And I'll have communion with the Holy Ghost. And it takes a while to minister people to that confidence and to get the heart to open. <clears throat> you, know, you know the old worldly adage, once bit... Twice shy. Well. All right. The fear of the wicked. All right. The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. This is where we're describing how fear actually becomes a confidence in evil coming your way. The expectation of rejection, you become conf so confident in it that you believe it. You believe it more than, than reality. <clears throat> That's uh, when you're responding to your own perception of things that has been skewed by your wounds. <clears throat> All right. All right, and this is what hell is. Hell is separation, death, right? Death. Death and hell and cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Death. Death is rejection. For the, for the purpose of this, now death is physical death. And the scripture I read earlier in Hebrews, deliver them who all their lifetime are subject to bondage to the fear of death. Yeah, when we first come into the world, we have a fear of physical death because before we know Christ, we're not maybe not sure what comes after physical death. So there's a fear there. And Jesus tasted death so he could deliver us from that so he could be resurrected and bear us witness of resurrection. And I don't know, years back, if you remember, a couple of times I preached on resurrection, how all our faith somehow has to work its way back so that it's rooted in faith in the resurrection. So I have to believe in the power of God to resurrect me physically, in the fleshly body when I physically die. But I also need to believe God will resurrect me in a healing. God will resurrect me in a new, uh, lively, eternal hope if my other hopes die, if I die, if the old man dies, right? People are afraid of death. They're, they're afraid of the end of their hope. They don't want their hope to die because they have no reason to live. But God is going to bring us to the end of our false hope. 
So we just have to believe in the resurrection power of hope to resurrect us in our souls. After every cast down, every, after every disappointment, after every betrayal, after every rejection, God will raise us back up again. So we have to have faith in that resurrection as well. He'll resurrect you. The washing and regenerating and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is power. It is power. It's life-giving power. And it has to be regenerated, almost like a battery has to be recharged. That's why you have to hear the Word of God. That's why you say it over and over again. You know, the, the poor old battery, the same old electrons that came into it to recharge it last week. Man, it's the same old electrons coming into me again that came into me last week. Well, does the battery said, ah, I'm bored. I've seen these electrons be before. I don't, I don't want nothing to do with these electrons. I've seen them before. No, the battery takes them back in again and gets charged up again. So we preach the same things over and over and over again. And we get renewed. And we exhort one another daily. daily. Well, it's Forsake not the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is. All right, so Psalm 16, David says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrows. So what are these pains of hell? Rejection, wounds, fear of death. Now, everybody fears being rejected by everybody. Because then you are alone, right? You you, you need to identify with someone. You need to be accepted by something or someone else. Or you're, you're, you're alone. You're in that torment. See, everyone tries to do it. I heard sort of a clever little thing too. It was a saying. It was a, a ironic thing. He said, uh, "Is what was it? It said, when, whenever you... Uh, uh, it was... Uh, I can't remember it. I'll come back to that later. Sorrows of death can pass about me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Yeah, fear of death, fear of rejection. Well, I was saying last week, that's why I tried to become a rock star, because I was after acceptance. I was afraid of being rejected. You know, I suffered all kinds of what I felt was rejection by name-calling in school. And I'm sure that the people who called me names were just, I, I'm sure they, mo most of them were just, whatever, they, they probably didn't know what they were doing, and they probably didn't know the effect that it had on me or, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I don't really have a right to impute them. But when you're a little kid, you know, you, it, it, gets, it gets into your soul, right? You know, they call you names or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, so it gave me a little rejection complex. And I felt like I didn't belong because I was stood out as, as skinny, bone rack, skeleton, toothpick. And then they would laugh at me and all of that and made me feel rejected. And that sent me on a quest for rejection, for acceptance. Now we get to this, you know, we are accepted in the beloved. And this is what we need to perfect. This is the essence of having root in self. And these having no root in themselves. Endures for a while, but when tribulation, when people start rejecting them for the word's sake... They can't handle that rejection. It makes them feel too lonely and isolated, and they are compelled to compromise the word of God to hold their rejection, with, their acceptance with men. The well, Bible says he was disallowed of men, but chosen of God, precious elect. And that's the essence of having root in yourself: is having a heart exercised established in the love of God, knowing, as we were saying last week, you, you can't have, you know, confidence has to come to the, uh, mature to the point where all, uh, eventually you're not just confident, but you know, you know. Beloved, we know we are of God. Yeah. I know God has visited me. I know God has uh, chosen me. Well, that's one of the first things God ever said to me in Urim. Was the Holy Ghost speaking directly to my conscience that I ever recognized, where it was the Lord actually talking to me, was, uh, you have not chosen me, he said. I have chosen you. Now I have ordained you that you should bring forth fruit and your fruit should remain. 
And I believe at that time I wasn't, I wasn't familiar that that was a scripture. And so I went over and I opened the Bible and it opens to that scripture, which is... All right, so then you have experiences like that, then you have confidence, right? Then you know that you are accepted, accepted in the beloved. That's another reason why, you know, it's, sometimes it's difficult just on your own to hold that um, confidence and perception that you're accepted by God. I mean, sometimes you have to do it alone. Sometimes you do. We get to that point. What are you going to do if there's no one around? And so, But on the other hand, let's exhort one another daily while it is called today. Because we need to cultivate that acceptance that we are accepted in the Beloved. And if you have that root in yourself that you are accepted of God, you don't need the acceptance and honor of men. The wicked in his pride... Uh, does not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. The pride of his countenance, his face, his image. The wicked through concern of what his image is like to other men. He's in an exercise to maintain his image in the sight of other men. Therefore, he will not seek after God. He's too busy maintaining how he appears before men. Well, that's something we can't care about. If you have root in yourself, then you don't care what other men think. And if you care too much what other men think, then you're compelled to maintain their acceptance and you're dependent on acceptance from without and the state of perfection. And, and I know we have to get to that perfection. We're not all there and we... we, we uh, this kind of perfection is at varying abilities and levels and everything, but perfection is when <clears throat> you don't need that from without. You've got it from within. Jesus says, The devil has come for me now, and he hath nothing in me. The devil has nothing in me. The devil can't tempt me. The devil can't draw me away. Why couldn't the devil draw Jesus away? Because Jesus had his root in himself. He knew he came out from God. He knew he was going to return it to God. He knew he was the beloved Son of God. He loved the Father, and the Father loved him, and he was accepted by God, and that was his completeness, and you are complete in him. When you're in him, then you know that God loves you, and you love God, and you are accepted in the beloved. Who cares what man thinks? That's easier to say obviously, but there is root in self. And if you get that, then you are strong. You don't have a fear of death. You don't have fear of losing face amongst other men. What have you. So that's very important. Okay. <clears throat> so, rejection. Rejection. You know, God says, uh, him that overcometh, so on and so on, and I will not blot out his name <coughs> out of the book of life that I've written. Well, the book of life is akin to being accepted. Yeah. If God accepts you, then he writes your name in the book. Okay, yeah. I'll write you in my book. Okay, I accept you. <clears throat> and we all have our little book of life. You know, I like this guy because he likes me and tells me the things I like to hear. This guy I don't like. So I, I will just reject him. Poo on you. And So what did I do? I blotted him out of my book. So it, you, you want to look at a book of life like uh, a list of who you, you accept and reject. And you accept them, you write them into the book. You don't accept them, you blot them out. God blots your name out, God rejects you. God writes your name in, He accepts you. Now according to Revelation... The book of life is something you can be written in and then blotted out. <laughs> but nevertheless, God knows them that are His. All right, so I'm talking about Psalm 116. I was talking about the pains of hell, and I'm relating it to rejection, fear of death, fear of being rejected. Uh, and then I called upon the Lord. Lord, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and helped me. Now Psalm... 
41. Blessed is he that considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him, keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. I said, Lord, be merciful unto, thee, unto me. Lord, I said, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. So why do you sin against God? Because you've got a wounded soul. And when you've got a wounded soul, you're protecting yourself. You're keeping yourself. You can't trust any, anybody or anything. You're, you're, you're left to fend for yourself, by yourself, and you take all the wrong provisions from sin. Because once you're behind the wall, the, you, you don't let anybody in, including the Lord. What did Jesus say? Behold, I'm knocking at the door. You're still behind that wall. Open up. I want to come in there and heal you. Well, then you go back to uh, Jericho. It was a walled city. So what did they do? Well, they just kept marching around, blow the trumpet. <laughs> the walls come crashing down. So we'll just, we'll just march around here, blow a trumpet, preach the word. And then we'll come back again, and we'll march around, and we'll blow the trumpet, and we'll preach the word. Right? Sooner or later, all your walls of protection can come crashing down. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, <coughs> heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. And, you know, uh, forgiveness is when any man shall know his own sore and his own grief. You got to get down to that grief and that sore and that wound and that bitter rejection and that uh, all the stuff that's at the root of all sin and iniquity <clears throat> that eventually gets you behind a wall and excludes God's entrance. And that's the t that's the real most. This is the most grievous thing about um, watching. People in a authority, let's say, that give occasion for other people to lose confidence in authority through the misuse of authority. You know, if you're around the misuse of authority too much, then you're going to be exercised to not trust authority anymore. Our generation sure, certainly has an issue with authority, isn't? Doesn't it? <clears throat> you know, despisers of dominion. You might throw the indictment against the rebels. You're rebels, and you despise dominion. And that's true, and I'm not taking anything away from that indictment, but there's another part of the indictment too. When the uh, dominion is perverse, or if the dominion gives occasion, or if the dominion misuses authority, that's why Paul said, I said it before, I'll say it again, giving no offense in anything, so that the ministry isn't blamed. So Satan doesn't have an advantage to try to paint a bad picture of authority in the minds of those who are lesser in rank in the body of Christ. Because those who are underneath authority, they're less mature, they're less comely. They have more potential to be offended and taken. And that's the whole, epis, that's the whole um, indictment of uh, woe to the shepherds in Ezekiel 34. You fed yourselves and you have not fed the flock. The disease have you not strengthened. And so on and so forth. And then it says, and so my sheep became meat to every beast of the field. They became a prey for every unclean spirit to capitalize and harden their hearts to submitting to authority. Because they're given such a crappy example of authority. So there's, all I'm saying is I'm not blaming just the authorities. I'm not blaming just the rebels. Uh, but there's, there's, a, there's a just balance here and there's cause and effects on both sides of the issue, right? Otherwise Ezekiel wouldn't have said so. All right, so the book of life. <laughs> you know, there's a okay. scripture there that says about the sting of death for natural man, the sting of death is sin. Sin. Yeah. So if there's sin in your life, then you know your sin is because you have not received Jesus. Okay, and then talking about wounds and... <clears throat> And rejection and stuff. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit <laughs> who can bear. Remember I said last week there's times I felt like a rabied animal. 
That's because my spirit was wounded. And, you know, and after the fact, I look back and I say, boy, if anybody kind of ran away from me last week, I, I think I know why, because I was so miserable. Or, or I might, you know, come to that conclusion. Well, I have come to that conclusion at various times because a wounded spirit is a wounded spirit is this spirit that only expects rejection that cannot be appeased there uh, well somewhere you better get to a point where you can be healed and everything else but i know david went through a period where he said uh my sore ran in the night my soul refused to be comforted well, you better not stay in that. I mean, may, we may have experiences like that where we go through a period where our soul refuses to be uh, healed. But the Bible says <laughs> that let it rather be healed. Like make straight paths for your feet. Not Let not that which is lame be turned out of the way. I mean, God strikes you and gives you a blow for sin or iniquity or something, and it makes you fight, makes you weaken the spiritual legs, so to speak, and you don't feel like walking in faith anymore because you took such a blow from God. You know, Jesus says, "Be zealous and repent, and let not the, that which is lame be taken out of the way, but let it rather be healed." You have to open yourself up to healing, and part of the wounds and rejection um, <clears throat> vision from the sister. Uh, she says, well, how can these sheep be healed? And Jesus says, well, it's going to take time, but they're going to have to focus on me. We have to just stop and focus on me. And that's what I'm saying is somewhere in all the uh, complex array and network of strongholds and walls that we have, walls of protection, fear, expectations of things, uh, bitterness, and, all, and so on, uh, we have to get a wound uh get to a place where we're confident to open our hearts where we can we can be healed of course no one promised that you're never going to get wounded again that's what <laughs> right no one ever promised that because it is a cup of rejection but it's like i said before you're going to be rejected one way or another right i mean you got three crosses a thief on the left a thief on the right and jesus in the middle they're all on the cross. Yeah. You know, we're, we're on a cross. Hopefully, we'll be on a cross suffering for righteousness' sake. When we're first saved, we, we're like the... Well, before we're saved, we're the bitter old man. We're mocking God, so to speak. Then all of a sudden, when we realize, and we answer the call, Jesus' is called to salvation, we realize, wow, I'm a sinner, and Jesus knew no sin, and he died for my sins. He did nothing wrong. And we're saying, you know, God save me, remember me. And God brings us into the kingdom, and then, then we mature, and we get root in ourselves, and then we can actually move and mature up to suffer for righteousness' sake. But either way, you're on a cross, right? You're, you're going to suffer rejection one way or another. So it's kind of almost a comforting way to look at it, saying, well, it it's, it's kind of makes it makes the mindset a little uh, more a little easier for the spirit of your mind to just resign and say, yeah, well, we're going to suffer anyway. So why, we might as well apply ourselves to suffer for righteousness sake. All right, you are young. I write to you young men, you are strong. And the word of God is, is in you. What that means, I talked about that last week too, briefly. That means that you're strong. You don't have that fear, that tormenting fear. Your heart is established by grace. You know that you are accepted in the beloved. You have root in yourself. Even if you make mistakes, suffer rejection, or do whatever, you have enough hope, faith, and confidence in God to endure the judgment that will come, the correction, the operation of God that will bring you to perfection. You're, you're past the fear thing. You're established. Accepted in the beloved. Beloved, we know we are of God. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It's got to be in you somewhere. The Bible says that that witness is in you. If you're a child of God. <clears throat> so, a spirit of a man. If you're strong in your spirit, it, it, will, it will sustain your infirmity. A wounded spirit who can bear. That works also on, on the side of evil and on the side of righteousness. Now, if you wound God's spirit by rejecting his call to salvation all, all your life long, and eventually you blaspheme the Holy Ghost by ignoring his call to be saved, and you sore wound the heart of God with that kind of rejection, and you stand before him and he's full of that rejection, who, who's going to bear that? 
who's going to bear standing before a, a, a God whose love has been spurned? And here we heard Brother Stare, when does God's love turn to wrath or hate? First, it's grieved because of rejection. Then, when, when it's uh, finally determined that there's no hope, it's total rejection, who, who can bear it? God's wounded spirit. You wound the spirit of God, who's going to bear it? Because he's going to be livid. He's going to pour out his wrath. And the same is, is, is when you're wounded with the wounds, wounds of rejection and the gall of bitterness, you just eventually become very miserable. If we hope in Christ in this life, only we are of all men most miserable. So, and this, this, you can relate this to what I was saying last week about hope too. Because part of the deceitfulness of sin is to get us to place hopes in this life or misplaced hopes or hopes not set in God or letting the hopes develop, develop into a vision or a description or a vision that, that the devil can disappoint, bring us to disillusionment, which is the forerunner to bitterness, which is sin deceived us to hope in something we shouldn't have hoped in. Sin deceived us into putting our trust in something we shouldn't have put our trust in. You know, people, you see it all over the world. People without God. They put their trust in the government. <laughs> who, you know, as Christians, I mean, I don't want to belittle anybody who isn't saved unnecessarily. We as Christians, if we are mature enough and we have the knowledge of God, we know Jesus didn't have to testify to anybody about man. He knew what was in man. We know what's in the government. We know it's deceitful. We know politicians are... Uh, the political system which is a bunch of unrighteousness and so on and so on. I would never put my trust in the political system. I'll put my trust in what, however God wants to use all of that to fulfill his purpose. But I won't trust in the government to, to do something always on my behalf and to conduct itself always in righteousness on my behalf. I'd never put my trust in the government. You know, but, but sin gets people to do that. And then what happens? They get disillusioned at their government. And they get angry at their politicians. And eventually, you see demonstrations and riots and violence. And, well, because their spirits have been wounded. Who can bear all that? Governments can't bear it. So they have to fire their tear gas or whatever. Bring out their riot squads. All right. <coughs> wounded spirit. Okay, well, I guess I don't have much more to say than that. Hallelujah. You, uh, I'll say one more, just one more thing. Yeah, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and he did not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Well, let me just, again, uh, support why we need to exhort one another. Matthew 24, many shall be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. All right, so we're looking for a place of rest, peace, wholeness, completeness. You are complete in him. And if you are complete in him, and rooted in him, you don't need the praises of men. <clears throat> the Pharisees knew who Jesus was, but they wouldn't confess him because they loved the praises of men more than the... So what do we love more, the acceptance of men or the acceptance of God? The acceptance of God will empower you to bear the rejection of Christ, which is, again, if we're going to have to suffer rejection anyway, it may as well be the rejection of Christ, where we can have intimacy with him and the fellowship of his sufferings. But we need to support each other in all of that, exhort one another, and so on and so forth. Accepted in the beloved. We know we are of God. God bless you.